It was just before 7.30 p.m. on February 9th, 2004, when Maura Murray was last seen. Her car was found damaged, locked, and abandoned on Route 112 just outside of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Her disappearance has haunted and frustrated family, friends, and a community of people searching for the truth. Since that night, there has never been a credible sighting. You're listening to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Lance, what, um, I know, I know we've said it before that we had a crazy week, but seriously, this was definitely the craziest week we've had so far while doing this show. Sure. Sure. It's been, uh, it's been, it's been nuts this week. Uh, honestly feels like it's, uh, taken about a month. It's been a long week. So last weekend we were in New Hampshire. We went on location and we went to meet John Smith up near where he lives in the White Mountains. Exactly. And our original intent was to go up there to follow up on an email that James Renner received about a year and a half ago. It was um, coordinates. The subject line in the email said, stop looking. And the coordinates were a place within the White Mountains right outside of Lincoln, New Hampshire. So we went up there to uh, go on a hike. We brought a person who was very, very familiar with the White Mountains. He was going to be our guide. And we were good to go until until, uh, certain emails came through. And yeah, the whole weekend just kind of fell apart. We had a great Saturday. We were up there on October 24th on Saturday, and we were going to go on the hike on October 25th on the Sunday. Right. The entire weekend was planned around the Sunday hike. And this was about the same time where we started to talk to John Smith a little bit more, and we started to establish a level of trust between him and us. So we told him we were going to be in the area, and it was uh, just really good timing. Uh, We decided we'll go up there a little bit earlier on Saturday. We'll spend the day with him on Saturday, stay over, do the hike the next morning. And that day went fantastic. Saturday was really great. We had a wonderful time with John Smith. Great guy. Honestly, really enjoy his company. Um, And I just want to point out that we don't agree with 100% of the things he says or writes on Twitter, but that doesn't mean we can't agree with what he says about the Maura Murray case. Exactly. It's, It's like I don't even see that as like a relevant issue. You know, I we we went up there. It was a like you said, it was a great day. It was a great drive. First of all, uh, the 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 weather was clear on Saturday. Um, it was a great autumn drive in New England. We get up there, we find his house. It's exactly how you picture it. Um, and uh, yeah, you talk to him, and he's just a, he's just a regular guy from New Hampshire. And he said it himself. He says some stuff online just to draw people out, just to get a rise in people. We're not paying attention to that. What I'm paying attention to is his 11 and a half years on the case, the physical stuff he has in his hands. I don't care what he says online to get a rise out of people. That's not even close to what we talked about when we were with him. We had a great day. We went with John Smith to the accident site, filmed some really interesting stuff there. We also met up with Tim Westman, the husband of Faith Westman, who uh, heard an a-, a sound and looked out her window and called 911 about Mora um, and the accident. So she is really the first witness of the accident. And then Butch Atwood came along a little while later. So we speak with Tim a little bit. We're going to play the audio in just a little bit. But what we want to get to, to set this clip up, is that after we dropped John Smith off that evening, we went back to our hotel at the Roadway Inn in Lincoln, New Hampshire, and some freaky stuff happened to us. Yeah, right. We, I mean, we were all set to go, right? We were all set to go to on the hike. 
we had a little, you know, we went and had some food with the guy who was going to take us up to the hike, kind of filled him in on some stuff that had happened during the day. He was totally into it. Yeah, we go back to the motel room and uh, and that's when everything just kind of, uh, well, we kind of felt like we were being watched before that, but we really weren't sure. It could have just been a series of coincidences. And at some point you have to stop looking at it as a series of coincidences and look at it as some somebody knows something and they're fucking with us. Before we left for Lincoln, we received a tweet that we found very curious. It was a picture of a heads up penny from 1982 on a disposable coffee lid and the significance of that is just that it's abraham lincoln and we were going to the city of lincoln new hampshire for the night right and 1982 was a year on the penny and i mean instantly when you see it and it says hashtag more murray at more murray dock at james renner you know 1982 is the year that more murray was born so that wasn't accidental right and so at that point we had a feeling that someone may be monitoring our emails. I don't know how else someone would have known we were in Lincoln or we were going to Lincoln. Yeah, and I'm kind of nervous even talking about people monitoring our emails. What the fuck? Yeah, it's pretty It's pretty creepy. And the timing of uh, the emails that we got that really freaked us out were even more freaky. I guess... With, let, let's play this clip, this, this yeah. first clip of us from Saturday night up in the White Mountains from the roadway in Motel. Let's talk about all the, all the Miles Wainwright emails because they started a few weeks ago. And uh, we, at first we didn't think it was all really that, all that creepy. The first one didn't say anything. It, uh, oh, actually, the, the subject was uh, the killing time, dot, 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 unwillingly mine, dot, 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 the killing moon, dot, 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 came too soon, dot, dot, dot. Right. And who sings that? Echo and the Bunnymen. Right. Turns out to be lyrics from an Echo and the Bunnymen song called The Killing Moon. I wrote back, great song, cold, uh, question mark, and that was someone that we thought it was, that I thought it was, a guy, a friend of ours that we'd like to think of, well, we'd like to think is our friend, I don't know, we, we spoke to him on the phone once, his name's Cold and Holefield, yeah, seems another, like a good another, guy. No, another podcaster, Yeah, somebody who um, we talked to, seemed, yeah, exactly, seemed like a good guy, we're on the same uh wavelength like as far as it was uh you know like sense of humor mm -hmm. and um uh, he's a big catcher in the rye fan yeah uh, as yeah. you can tell by his name and to be honest mm -hmm. when you had said that this was cold i really like it didn't strike me as cold at all right the other thing about cold is he is anonymous so it makes you wonder why and he posts in his blog a bunch of youtube videos and that was why i assumed it was him because well, all we got was a youtube video so then this person wrote back, you're barking up the wrong tree with your suspicions of Fred. He would nothing wrong. He, sorry, let me get the grammatical errors correct. He'd nothing to do with it. He knows nothing. That's it. And this was on October 11th. And then I wrote back to him again. I don't think you're listening closely enough if you think we believe Fred Murray had something to do with it. We set out to talk about all angles and can't do that without talking about Fred. I don't believe Fred had anything nefarious or did anything nefarious or had anything to do with Mora's disappearance. Um, I could, however, believe he was part of the reason Mora wanted to get away for a brief period of time. That's about it in my mind. What do you think and why are you anonymous? He wrote back, uh, actually, he waited a few weeks to write back. That was October 11th, and then we were about to leave for this hike on Saturday morning. Today is, what, the 23rd? Yep. We woke up to, well, I woke up, I guess it came in last night at 10.30, or maybe it was this morning. Um, it, his email says, you guys must know by now that she ain't alive and that you're not going to find her, not her corpse, and certainly not her walking around the streets of Nashua, Montreal, 
or some small New England town in person. This will definitely be a tough case for you to solve. I wish you luck though. Night sky, white mountains, full moon on Friday, Saturday, February 2004. Dissipating some on Sunday and so much more on Monday. Whatever the fuck that means. And then he wrote back, maybe it was about 45 minutes later. Yeah, definitely a full moon that weekend, but not on that Monday. And we're referring to the Monday of the disappearance. That's what he's referring to, yeah. Sure. And then he wrote back again at uh, even later, maybe an hour and a half later. For your interest and that of Mora's, I'd suggest that you be mindful how you tread into this thing. There are reasons why no one has been able to crack this case. Mora's victimology is apparent, so spending too much time on her before her murder is kind of a waste of time. She was a victim of quote-unquote opportunity, and I'd ask that you respect Fred and her family, both of whom had nothing to do with this, and know she isn't alive. So be careful not to agonize them any more than they've already been. Which is a Interesting way to put it, not to agonize them. Yeah. I've just never heard anybody say it like that. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Uh, it's pretty weird, weird email, obviously. I wrote him back. Um, so why don't you go to the cops then if you know what happened to Mora? Miles Wainwright, while we were with Wolfman, wrote us back. He, while we were... With John Smith. I have that email coming in at 1226. That means we were with John Smith already. No. That's what I got. No, I just can't find that. I just can't find that email. Oh, shit. It just went to me. Oh, fuck. Okay, well, the email came through at 1226 p.m., and it actually just went to me. He wrote back, Now, I never said I knew what happened, and that was at 1226 p.m. That was when we were with John Smith. Yeah, because we were we picked at him up his at place like, at like 1215, 1220. 1220, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And then... We proceed to have a great day with John Smith. What did we do today, Lance? We we went to the accident site. We went yeah, to well, Morris I mean, site. first we went to his place, and mm-hmm. he was waiting for us outside. Mm-hmm. He, uh, you know, was, <laughs> was, was, was standing there. He's got his gun on his side. Yeah, all day. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. all day, had his gun on his side. We didn't question it. In fact, we even said that it made us feel more safe. Yeah, when we're at the accident site and the... Uh, uh, cars are driving by. All I'm thinking is like, it's, if anybody stops and they start talking to us, like, that's fine. There's a guy with a gun. Like, <laughs> I feel totally, totally comfortable right now. Yeah, and and again, like, we like John Smith. We think he likes us. Like, he's not going to use he the gun on likes us. us. Yeah, he's not yeah. going to use the gun on us. Like, we're not afraid that you know he he's not trying to threaten us yeah. with the gun. Yeah, we drive to the crash site. He we was... had a great conversation on the way over there. I can see how it would be frustrating for you to, um, and you and people who know a lot more about this than we do, people on the ground zero basically in this area, um, who have searched, who who know more than we do, uh, and and we start this podcast about this, and we're uh, and this documentary, and you know obviously you guys you don't know our intentions, um, you you are probably not going to be receptive to an interview with us for what reason. Um, and it's like, like, you know, when we were asking people for interviews and everything, it's, it, it kind of, it, I failed to realize that why would, why would they do interviews with us? Why would they trust us? I've been sitting at my house because that's pretty much what I do now. In the early days, I was on the road all the time. And like I say, you know, I have so many places that I've been, so many notes of every place that I've been, interviews that I've done. And now it got to the point where it was just like it was it was fruitless going out because there was nothing really to gain. You know, there was nobody to interview. There was no one, no new places to go and look. So I started most of my research from doing a lot more research online, as well as, like you said before, kind of um, alienating people on these sites to try and get them to to say stuff and in like I said in some instances people gave themselves up and they went away mm-hmm. you know I mean I had people that used people that fought with me and um, tried to defame me and discredit me 
because I kept pushing the not hitting a tree and that the car more than likely hit a stationary object that was about the height of the hood or a vehicle that would have been about the same height. And I had people telling me that I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, you know, and being an ex-police officer, I've investigated accidents and I know what I know. And I don't care if I was only a police officer for three years or not. I'm, I'm a smart man and I'm not bragging, but I have a lot and I have common sense. And, and if you look at something and you try to put it into the, you know, where it's going into a tree, there's just no way that, you know, it happened. So, you know, that is the kind of stuff that I've been dealing with for the past 11 years, pretty much, because people come onto the scene pretty quick and took on that troll type of attitude and everything. And, you know, people called me that for a little while because I was doing what I was doing. Um, I never went out and accused people of stuff. I said these things happen. Um, you know, but I never really put it into, you know, anyone's name into it or anything. I just kind of threw stuff out there. And, and then that's when people started attacking me and everything. And after a little while of giving, you know, just never letting down my guard, they finally just gave up. They're like, well, you know, he's never going to stop saying it. So, yeah. and I won't. So that's John Smith and uh, me and Lance in the car going over to the accident site. You know what I would like to say about it is that um, is that this guy adapted from being a uh, like you know lace up the bootstraps and let's go on field and and be a detective to understanding how to deal with the online people because he started off as like an old school like. You know, we're, we're going to go in the field, we're going to talk to people, we're going to, you know, scour the neighborhood. And this is, I, I can imagine, like, this is the first time that he's actually had to, like, deal with, with the, the cyber shit. It just, it shows me how adaptable he is. I don't think he was online with different monikers before this case. Yeah, probably not. Right, so it just shows how adaptable he is, shows how much passion he has on this case. He went out there with the family, and he's got his time in with the the search and rescue parties, and then once he realizes that this case is becoming more internet-based and more, like, network-based, he adapts himself to that as well. It's, It's pretty impressive to me. We then set up a few cameras, and we talked to John at the accident site, and uh, get him to give his theories on what he thought happened. Now, he also brought a measuring stick with him, which was a, a stick 21 inches uh, in the air and had a, had a flat bottom so you could lay it on the ground and it protruded up 21 inches. Yeah, it was basically a, a, little, um, a little base, a little wooden base plate and a, um, a dowel that went up 21 inches. So you could put it at different points on the ground, different elevations, and 21 inches was pretty much where the front bumper of the car would have been. Yeah, I believe he actually says 24 inches, but that is just the 21 is the length of the measuring stick. Well, 24 inches is probably to the top of the bumper, and then when you go down, that's that's probably where the bumper clears underneath the car. So let's go back to that night in the hotel room. We're talking more about John Smith. And we get into some of the Tim Westman audio. Tim Westman, he started mowing his lawn as uh, John Smith was outside. Um, and we were demonstrating, you know, we were shooting outside in, in the crash site, and he started mowing his ride riding mower. He he broke that out. Late October, you might as well <laughs> you might as well manicure your lawn. <laughs> and so we even said to ourselves, like, yeah, what's he doing? You know, he's clearly trying to ruin our audio. Um, and I don't think he did, but we ended up going over there trying to intercept. Faith Westman from going from her house, or actually I should say coming back from the weather barn to her house. 
That was what, what was I she doing do. over there? I don't know. She must have went over to take a look Because I was fucking around with the audio yeah. equipment at that point. And I, I never got to ask you. What was she? She walked out of she, out of her, her house, house to the weather barn. Did she go inside the weather barn? I think so. What's it, an antique shop or something like that? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's an antique shop or something like that. In yeah. There. There, were, there were a few cars in the lot. Uh, she was only in there maybe for five minutes. And I, I tried to get over there before she walked back to her house. And actually, I kind of missed her. She walked right past. And really, you know, she, she knew I was there trying to kind of, you know, with holding the camera, walking towards her. And she scurried in, closed the door. I rang the doorbell. She did not answer it, except uh, that at that point, her husband, Tim Westman, stopped his riding mower right uh, in front of the door. And, uh, and that's when me and uh, John Smith started talking with Tim. That was funny because I, <laughs> I was really, really, really tangled up um, with the cables. <laughs> I'm not even talking like metaphorically. I was really tangled up with the audio cables and I saw you guys walk over and I was really pissed because I didn't have anything plugged in and I had specifically said, don't do anything because I have to just organize myself. So give me two minutes. And then the next thing I know, I looked up and you guys are already over there and Tim Westman is mowing his lawn and finally I get everything plugged in and, uh, and this is what we have. Yeah, Tim gives us a little bit, and we apologize, the audio isn't all that great. There's a lot of wind going on, so uh, just bear with us. Again, like you said, it was a very spontaneous interview, so we were not prepared to mic. We didn't mic Tim up. I was planning to I understand. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, how are you? My name's Tim. Yeah, I was just looking at your blog, I think. Oh, really? Oh, um, no, I... Oh, yes, yeah, we do the podcast, yeah. Um, yeah, we're uh, we're trying to find out what happened to Mora. I know a lot, I know a lot of people have bugged you about it in the past and uh, yeah. tried to find out themselves, and at this point, you know, it's 11 and a half years later. Who knows if, if it's ever going to happen? But, um, yeah, we're, we're trying our hardest to, uh, to find out what happened. Would you... Uh, Want to talk to us at all? No, I've talked to too many people already. Yeah. I haven't got anything different to say. Yeah. Whatever you heard. <laughs> uh, some of it isn't true. Isn't yeah, I'm sure a lot of it isn't true. Yeah. Um, can I ask one one question about about um, what you and your wife saw that night? Um, was there? I know that her first report was that there was a person smoking a, a, in the passenger seat, a man. Do you remember that? Uh, we saw a glow in the passenger seat. There was only ever one person. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Good. That clears, that helps, that helps us for sure clear up a lot. Cause... The only thing I'll tell you is the ribbon's on the wrong tree. We know that. Oh, it's on the and wrong we, tree? We, we've always, that was the tree that we were told from the beginning that police told us that she hit. And we. And we've often wondered why. Her, was her car further down, Tim? Oh, yeah. It was. One of the group of three there. Just... Oh, really? So the, the, the next three passed the blue ribbon. Yeah, but there's one and then there's three together. Yep. She hit one of those. She headed towards those. Okay. She came around this corner with a complete UV and ran into the tree. Oh really? That car didn't hit the tree. No, it didn't, Tim. Well, you we could, here. What's that? You I might not have she been here, but she did a U-turn. She smashed into the tree and ended up facing this way. Well, sure. well, she might have spun out on the corner, but accident so reconstruction of well, know that she didn't okay. hit the tree. Time to leave because I was here and you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're, we're not no, trying I, to make up. I don't want to argue with you, oh. sir, at all. Okay, I don't want to argue with you, sir, at all. I, I'm just saying the accident reconstructionist said that they didn't hit a tree, so could it just have hit the snowbank and caused that? There damage? was no snowbank. What do you mean there was no snowbank? It was perfect. A little bit of snow, the road was completely clear there. But there was no snowbank on the side of the road? There might have been a, you know, a foot. A you can't bit. hit a foot. But that damage, would have, that, that snowbank would have caused that lower part of that car to be broken all to pieces, and it didn't do that. So. And I like, tell, all I can tell you what I heard. Yeah, and, and, and I, like I say, yeah, and that's why I'm that's why, that's why I'm putting in your mind the fact that accident reconstructionist people are people yeah, who look well, at I the car. I don't care about them. They weren't here either. No, but when somebody looks at the damage to a car right. and they can see, they know that it wasn't something that big that caused the damage. You see what I'm saying? 
That's that's my argument. I, and like I say, is you you can argue all you want. Were you here ten years ago? I was here eleven and a half years ago, sir. Whatever. Yeah. I was here eleven and a half years ago. Well, from from day one, I've been on this case. So. Okay, fine. Well, and and I saw the car right after it hit the tree, or excuse me, after they said that it hit the tree, and from the day one. Where was it? It was at Lavoie's. Yeah. yeah. And I well, talked to. All I can uh, tell you is there was a scar on the tree, and it disappeared, and heard the noise. She actually. She accelerated before she hit the tree, and that you know why would why would she accelerate? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. Guess. Did you hear other cars come by after that? Sure. She probably hopped in one of those. You think? Anything's possible. Yeah. I suppose you've spoken to the school bus driver before he moved. Yeah, I, t I interviewed Butch twice. I talked to your wife face twice. Anyway, they put him through the Yeah. Well, you know, in a case like this, I mean, everyone has to be looked at and asked questions when, especially he was a witness. So when you look at it that way, he was the last person in theory to see her other than your, your wife saying that she was still at the car and drove away. So that's something that has to be done. That's police work. So, you know, whether they put him through the ringer or not, I don't know. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a cop and I, I don't know what they did put him through, but I know that he moved away, whether that was because of all that they put him through no, or just the fact that he wanted to go someplace no, warmer. Was five years before he moved, but that mm -hmm. wasn't. Right. So, so you know, again, I, you know, I, we're not here to argue with anybody. We're just trying to solve a case and trying to help the Murray family get some closure. And, and you know, again, like you said, so we don't want, we don't want anyone to be you know, scrutinize. Okay. So you've got your first problem because I'm telling you to hit the tree. Well, and and <laughs> the only reason that I'm arguing with you about that yeah, well, is because of what I understand what why a you're arguing. Who, I'm just saying there was a very loud noise after she accelerated, and the car was facing this way on the side, okay. and there was a scar on the tree. Okay. So. Was the tree marked? Was it damage from the car when the car hit it? I just said there was a scar on the Oh, tree. I didn't hear you. I thought you said star. Sorry. Okay, I'd like to get on with this if I might. Yeah. You, sir. You, and very good. Thank you for your help. We really yeah, appreciate very, it. We really appreciate very nice. you Thank you very much for talking to us. Talking to us. You know? And we know you've been through a lot, and we're not here to harass you, sir. We just, if you were willing to talk to us, and I'm just, you were telling me your side, and I'm telling you what I knew on my side, so yeah. we can kind of mesh our stories. That's all. I don't want to argue with anybody. Okay. Good luck. I Thank you. Very good. I don't think there is a solution. You don't think there is ever going to be a solution? Uh, no. Do you think she probably got in the passing vehicle and sent that out the door? And if that's true, gonna find it. Right. And if that's true, if she did get in a vehicle, she, she they could have driven her to California. She could be in a, you know, in oh, a ditch in California. Alive. I'm not saying she's dead. Or she could be dead. She could be alive. And yeah. that's true. Yeah. You know, and we don't know that. Oh, I hope so. so thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Westman. Thank you. We appreciate you your help. You've got to be pretty clever these days to disappear like that. <laughs> I yeah, know. absolutely. It's not, you know, it's it's not, not, easy, it's not easy like it used to be. No. <laughs>
and then hit the tree. And and Tim says that the tree that she hit wasn't the tree with the ribbon around it. It was actually, if you're looking at the site... A few uh, trees back. Uh, yeah, to the left, a little bit down yeah. the road, the way she was going. So that was interesting. And then uh, and then that's when John Smith started uh, you know, g- getting into it a little bit with Tim. Yeah. I can't get it out of my head, though, and I hate to keep saying this. There was something there with the... Uh, with the glow would he said that there was a glow but she said that there was a man smoking a cigarette i don't know what what's there doesn't it seem like something that's like right in front of you but you can't get your get your grasp around well yeah you said it that Someone, someone's lying essentially, and it's. I don't know if someone's lying or if someone's misremembering, but something was, something happened in that car that directed their attention to the passenger seat. It's been eleven and a half years, and the guy still remembers there being something happening in the passenger seat, whether it was a glow or what Faith had said to the operator when she called in that there was a man smoking a cigarette something's happening in the passenger seat maybe it was something as simple as faith saying to the dispatcher "Eh, you know it looks like there might be someone in the passenger seat i see a red glow maybe that's someone smoking a cigarette and then you know a minute goes by you know and she takes that back but it was already typed out and that's the official report sure which would fit in with everything else that's happened with this case would like I don't want to say shoddy police work, but kind of uh, run-of-the-mill police work. Oh, someone kind of went off the side of the road, and I'm just going to kind of type in whatever details this person gives me. Because, you know, they they didn't think that it would become what it's become at this point. You know, they probably, they they definitely thought that it was a, 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 you know, a drunk driver goes off the side of the road and runs away and will show up later. But there's still something about that. Isn't there something about that to you? Yeah, it's odd. It just keeps popping up. We we talked to the husband of the person who said that, and he says, no, it was a glow. I mean, maybe she opened her glove compartment or something. Maybe that was a glow, but Faith says it was a man smoking a cigarette in the passenger seat. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's strange. It definitely, you know, it, it begs a few questions. And I don't want to, like, start the whole thing where everybody starts speculating about you know what's actually you know the, there's a guy there or, you know, whatever it just keeps popping up it bugs me yeah i don't know what else to say about it it's uh, it's a strange it's a strange moment and unfortunately it may be one of those things that we never get the actual answer to or or maybe we have gotten the answer over exactly. and over exactly maybe we have yeah maybe that's it maybe there was some glow there maybe she opened the glove compartment and it reflected weird or maybe Faith saw a reflection off of her window when she looked out, and we're just completely overblowing this. Okay, so here is another clip from the night in the Roadway Inn where we start talking about what we're going to do on Sunday. came up here to um, follow up on the tip that was emailed to James Renner, the coordinates in the uh, on Mount Kerrigan, which basically said, stop looking, her body is here. Um, and then uh, that was about a year and a half ago, and James got another email um, in the beginning of October. It was like a, a little rhyme. Twice a year ago, I told you where look again she is still there so we had full intentions of coming up here this was planned for a few weeks mm-hmm. to we were come trying up here. to be private about it trying to be private uh only told a few people what exactly we were doing and even um even john smith didn't know what we were doing until today mm-hmm. like specifically what we were doing according to him mm-hmm. uh and uh, yeah, we had everything together. Had GPS navigation. We have a hiker with her. Or yeah, us, a had a guide hiker. with um, the you know the, uh, GPS unit navigation Com- locator. Completely freaked him though tonight. 
yep, completely freaked him out. Um, so, <laughs> needless to say, we will not be going on the hike tomorrow because of uh, emails we received from Miles Wainwright making us think that he knew where we were. And uh, oh. a veiled threat yeah. that came through. Oh, and don't forget about the penny that we got. And the penny, to us. yeah, yeah. Uh, on Friday, there was a. Uh, we were uh, mentioned in a tweet from someone named Deathpool. Uh, Boneyard. Boneyard. Oh, yeah, Boneyard, yeah. who operates a death pool. Right. I think their ha their handle is Deathpool 2015. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a uh, a shot of a penny on a uh, plastic uh, coffee, coffee lid, lid a to go lid. Uh, the penny was 1982. That was the year Moore was born, and it's Lincoln on the penny. Right. And Lincoln, the, New Hampshire. Lincoln, New Hampshire, and it said. Uh, in the trenches, deep in the trenches. Hashtag Maura Murray at Maura Murray Dock at James Renner. And that was uh, the day before that we left. And, um, and so that kind of put us... Uh, yeah. And we had told Renner that we were going to check out these coordinates. Uh, before that came through. No. Yeah. And then yeah, he sent us the email, and then that happened. And then after that, we uh, had a great day with um, yeah. John Smith. And then once we got back, we had the, uh, the email from Miles Wainwright. Yeah. Which read, Tommy Conrad was thinking about saying something before he was basically assassinated in front of his mother to send a message to everyone in the area to mind your own goddamn business. Clearly not a threat. Yeah, right. Yeah. You wrote back, is that a threat? He wrote back, oh, definitely not. I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Have you talked with Tommy's family? Don't even know who Tommy is. Nope, and then you wrote that back to him, right? Yep, nope, don't know, don't know who Tommy is. Who are you? He said... I'm not trying to give you boys a hard time. I know your heart is in the right place. Truly. You said... Well, it sounded like a threat. It would make us feel much better if we knew who you were. So, who are you? Yeah, well, obviously he doesn't say. And then he goes on to saying, uh, you know, don't worry, I'm not a threat so, to you or anyone else. Trust me. Like, wh why would we trust you, buddy? Right. You just threatened us. Don't you have people that devoted years to this investigation? That Renner dude and that former Littleton cop? Ask them about, ask them about Tom Conrad. My feeling has been that if you solve Tommy Conrad's murder, a longtime resident of Haverhill, you might just cleanly, you might just back cleanly into Morris. Right. Surely your sources must know that his murder was never solved. Dude, if you know something, why don't you go to the cold case unit or or you want to talk to us so bad, come on the air. What freaked us out even more, actually, that night was that we received a couple of phone calls to our hotel rooms the phone rang and nobody was there. We asked the front desk the next morning. They said that they didn't call. Maybe your friend did. Well, we didn't call each other. Someone called. The phone calls came in probably at about, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't look at the time, but I think it was about six o'clock in the morning to our room. And the phone rang maybe three or four times and I went over to answer it, but it stopped. When we woke up in the morning, I had a text message from the man who was going to take us on the hike, and he had said that he had received a phone call in the morning, and that was the first text message, that was the first communication I had with him that morning, was that he had a phone call, and he answered, and there was nobody on the other line, and he went down to the front desk and asked if anybody had called him, and they said, no, maybe your friends in the uh, in, in in their room called you, and and 
he texted me and, and asked me that. I said, no. And he said, I got this call. And I told him, no, we got the we got a call too. So I don't know if we're like looking into it a little bit too much, but both of us got an anonymous phone call. Both rooms got an anonymous phone call the morning of the uh, the planned hike. To me, that says that someone either knew what rooms we were in, in the roadway inn, or someone called every single room at the roadway inn to freak us out. I mean, and, and unless I'm completely off base and uh, and this was just random again like you said, you know, an, uh, another coincidence. But how do you how do you measure randomness? You know, are they going to call every room at that motel just to freak somebody out? And the other part of randomness is is it just people kind of calling rooms and they have no idea what people are doing inside the rooms and they just want to freak people out. It was to our room and his room, as far as I know. We, we all know what we're talking about here. Like yeah. our, both of our rooms had a weird phone call. And I didn't tell Rick about our phone call until he told me about his. So definitely sort of a freaky night for us. And I think this is a good moment uh, to, to say this to the audience. You're all following this. Because it's entertaining and it's a mystery and you want to solve it. But when you're actually put into the situation, it's like very real. And we cannot deliver information to you in a way where it's delivered like entertainment purposes. Because this isn't entertainment. This is, it's, it's, it's an open investigation. And it's real life to us. And it's real life to everybody. Yeah, it's it's real life to us. It's real life to the family. It's real life to John Smith. It's real life to everybody. And yeah, we do owe the listeners something, but not at the expense of the family or us. We can't force anything out. And shit starts to get a little scary. And it might not mean anything when you're in your own home and, you know... You go outside and you're familiar with your own street and the cars that drive up and down your street. But when you're in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and you're getting these these tweets and these emails, it's different. You start to look around and you start to see a car parked across the street that's been there for three hours. And it looks like this person might be watching you. It wouldn't mean anything if we weren't warned about it in the first place. I mean, we talked to John Smith, and he's told us many times that he's stepped on a lot of toes. And then the next thing we know, we're getting anonymous phone calls. We have these weird tweets. We have these weird emails. So maybe we're being a little bit paranoid, but I'd rather be paranoid than dead. And I get it. Like, we do... Everyone's following this. They want something to happen, but... They all have to know that there's no end to this right now. There's no end at this point. So we can't wrap things up nicely. This isn't this isn't a a pre-scripted series. It's still out there. And we're learning and we're experiencing everything right along with everybody else. All right, so thank you for listening to the Missing Mora Mari podcast. And uh, we are postponing the East Boston meetup on November 7th. We are going to do it, just not there and not at that time or date. We are going to increase security and make you verify your identity before you get the address. And it's really about making sure that everybody has a good time. Because what we really wanted to do was bring in the people who are passionate about the case and thoughtful and we can have a good discussion. I just want to say that everything is kind of hot right now and we want to do it when things aren't so hot. And with that said, please follow us on Twitter at missing Mora Murray doc. We're on Instagram. We are also on Facebook. And if you have anything you'd like to say to us directly, or if you have anything that you think we are missing or you want to talk to us about, please email us at missingmoramari at gmail.com. But if you have any actual tips, please first go to the New Hampshire State Police. There is a cold case unit email address that is very readily available. 
please do not contact us if you have any information about the whereabouts of Mora. Go to your local authorities, go to the cold case unit. We honestly cannot do anything legally to help you.